let's discuss now existentialism. So what is, is what is existential philosophy? What is existentialism? Existentialism stems from the 19th century romantic revolt against reason and science in favor of a passionate involvement in life. Medyo mabigat yung, yung term na yun. What do you mean by this revolt against reason? Well, historically, if you're going to see, the last important philosopher during the modern era was Hegel. Okay, so Hegel, in the philosophy of Hegel, we saw the, you know, the glorification of reason. So they, they say, reason fulfilled its promise. Okay. The, the real is the rational and vice versa. And of course, together with reason, the advancement in science. Okay. Scientific discoveries and then the application of science to, uh, to in uh, the combination of science and technology and so on and so forth. But what is the result of this advance of reason and science? The result is that we focus more on the big, you know, the systems. Like for example, in the case of, of Hegel, how history progresses to you know to the advancement you know, of the absolute according to hegel if we have to understand the whole okay understand the whole but with this focus on the system on reason on science have forgotten that hey we have life we have individual lives man is not just all reason reason and reason according to Kierkegaard we have passions it's not just about the will the absolute will or the absolute spirit we have our own individual wills we are not just, you know, we are not just logs in the stream of history where we are just following or flowing with the stream. Man has an individual will. He has a life. So there is this revolt against this reason in favor of this passionate involvement in life. So Kierkegaard developed this philosophy that many would characterize to be anti-systemic and anti-reason. Anti-systemic because, of course, the philosopher before him, Hegel, developed a system. Everything falls into that system and we're just following this system. And this system is guided by reason. And Kierkegaard said, no, we don't need to follow all these systems. We have our own individual decisions. And man is not just all reason, reason, reason. We have infinite passions. We have, we, we can, we love, we feel anxiety, excitement, anger, joy, etc. So Kierkegaard, focus and emphasize on the more personal or individual side of man. So that idea of Kierkegaard became very influential in with the philosophers, you know, the succeeding philosophers, Nietzsche, Heidegger, Jaspers, Sartre, Marcel, Buber, Camus, they all engage, they all uh, develop a kind of philosophy that is more personal and more subjective. They develop a philosophy that is based on their personal experiences. That's why 
Nietzsche would say something like, he said that the philosophy is a kind of memoir of a philosopher, a personal memoir of a philosopher. Your philosophy reflects your experiences. And true enough, many of these contemporary philosophers, especially existentialists, they develop their thoughts based on their personal experiences. Well, some of the philosophers that we've studied, like for example, the modern philosophers, hardly are they, their philosophies are reflections of their personal lives. But when you talk of Sartre, Marcel, Buber, Camus, Nietzsche, the philosophy starts our very core, our very lives. And that is the why perhaps many people identify with them. Because they can see their lives, the personal experiences in the thoughts and the philosophies of these thinkers. So, they have developed their own different approaches in doing this existential philosophy. Heidegger combined the phenomenological approach of Husserl with that of Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard stressing on the intense emotional experience and Heidegger combining that with, you know, with this conception of the negation of, of Hegel. So they developed this different notions of human existence and some of them of course they talk about god but when they discuss god it's not about talking of god as a being a being that is somehow detached or disconnected from human experience for them God is the source of values or God, so it's, it's like this, it's either they, they connect God to human experience and to human values or they just deny that idea of God as personal. But the thing is that the consideration of God is something that is personal, not the substance that Spinoza, okay, or the mother of monads that Leibniz was talking about. So for them, philosophy should be something that is personal. So what they did was to focus philosophy not on the metaphysical concepts, but on the more personal subject or topics like freedom, human existence, human values, authentic existence, meaning of life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's why many of these philosophers are called the philosophers of man, because they focus on human existence. Okay. Human existence. And that's actually where you get the word existentialism because they focus on human existence. Now, of course, although many of these philosophers, we call them to be existentialists, some of them never like the idea of regarding their philosophies as existentialist. So some of them are quite adverse to the term existentialism. Of course, we can trace the term existentialism from the works of Sartre, particularly because of Sartre's dictum about, uh, which says existence precedes essence. But the fact is, Sartre tried to avoid the term, but he became associated with the term existentialism 
people are talking about his philosophy as a kind of existentialism. So became, he became famous because of existentialism. And therefore, even if he does not like, didn't like the idea of the term existentialism, he had to explain to people what he meant by it, clarify what he meant by it. And eventually, of course, he accepted the term existentialism as a description of his philosophy. But there are other philosophers we call to be existentialists who would not be comfortable with the term existentialism. Take, for example, Suren Kierkegaard, the father, the acknowledged father of contemporary existentialism. Of course, the term existentialism was coined way after Kierkegaard. But he never considered himself to be an existentialist, or at least that he was talking about existence. Because he wrote, he said, I am a poet. Nietzsche, one of the precursors of the existentialist thought, would have probably rejected the idea of existentialism as a kind of description of his uh, philosophies. Heidegger denied the description of Sartre, of his philosophy, as a kind of existentialism or an atheistic existentialism. So for Heidegger, the term existential or atheistic existentialism is not a uh, it's not a appropriate description of his philosophy. Number one, he said he's not an existentialist. His philosophy is one of ontology. Why ontology? Because he was talking about the ontos, about being. And we can never regard Heidegger as a kind of an atheist because he never publicly denied God, God's existence. Okay. Well, he said man is a, is a being in time and beyond time, we don't know much about what is beyond time, what is beyond temporality. So he doesn't talk about what is beyond our temporal existence. And for not talking about what is beyond our temporal existence, which is God, it does not mean that he is an atheist. If you don't talk about God, it does not mean that you are an atheist. Or if you don't talk about, for example, uh, about Americans, that you are already anti-American because you don't talk about them. It does not follow. Okay. So Marcel, for a time, allowed himself to be called a Christian existentialist, but in the end, he opted for the more, you know, uh, the term neo-Socratic or a Christian Socratic. For him, it's a more accurate description of his, of his work or his philosophy. Jaspers, well, for a time, he talked about the philosophy of existence. Uh, sometimes it's spelled as with a Z, existence. But he rejected the terminology in favor of the term reason, philosophy of reason. Because there are so many things to talk about uh, Karl Jaspers. Now, <clears throat> let's go to the next point, medieval and contemporary philosophy. So, although we talk of existentialism today, which we regard as contemporary existentialism, but in the course of history of Western philosophy, there was another existential philosophy that emerged way back during the time of scholasticism. And this is the existentialism of St. Thomas Aquinas. Many writers expressed the opinion that St. Thomas's philosophy is the first articulation of existentialism. Because it was St. Thomas who made existence as the pivotal point in his entire philosophy. Of course, we talk about existence and essence. So, essence is the nature of the thing, 
it makes the thing what it is. But existence provides the actuality for that essence. So existence provides the actuality, it, actuality for that particular essence. So for St. Thomas, existence is a crucial element in his philosophy. So although we, we recognize the importance of the quid, quiddity of essence, but this quiddity, this nature becomes actual when it exists. So for many thinkers, the original existentialist is St. Thomas. But let's just call it Thomistic existentialism. And the other one is the contemporary existentialism. Okay? So the neo thomists of course, would say, well, St. Thomas is the original existentialist. Well, maybe because he was ahead of the contemporary or continental existentialist. But let's just say that both are existentialists, but they are existentialists in different senses. Okay? So, and of course, we know that the more popular type of existentialism is the continental or contemporary existentialism. Okay. Of course, some Thomists would argue that, well, the authentic existentialism is the existentialism of St. Thomas Aquinas. Well, we don't know what is the meaning of authentic. If by authentic we mean the first, then it will be considered the first. But authentic in what sense? We have to define what we mean by authentic existence. Anyway, and then aside from this, we make a distinction between theistic and atheistic existentialism. Um, the main question here is, what is the source of values, of meaning? Some philosophers would say that the source of value and meaning is a higher being, and that is God. So God is the source of the values, source of the meaning. Therefore, many philosophers look up to him as a source of meaning and values. They recognize his existence. Not only do they recognize his existence, they relate and communicate with this higher being. These are the theists. So Kierkegaard, when he talks of the single one, when he talks of the religious life, the leap of faith, of course, there is Gabriel Marcel. When he talks of hope in that being, Martin Buber, when he talked of the eternal Tao, of course, Nicolas Verjeev, when he talked of the absolute, and of course, Karl Jaspers. But there are also philosophers who would say that, well, the source of meaning and value of life is man himself. Let's do away with this being, with this divine being as a source of values. Let's remove that from the picture because the real source of meaning and value of life is man himself. Man creates his own values or discovers his own values. He creates his own meaning. There's no need to recognize the existence of this higher spiritual being we call God. And of course, the representatives of this are Sartre, Nietzsche, Camus, Dubois, among other things. Well, I have already mentioned about Heidegger. He belongs to a different class of his own. Okay. So somebody we can neither con consider to be atheist or things. So we have two groups of philosophers, the existentialist 
philosophers who are who believe in God, the theists, and the existentialist philosophers who deny God's existence. We call them the atheistic philosophers. Okay. Now, of course, if you talk of contemporary existentialist philosophers, more people recognize the atheistic philosophers like Camus and Sartre. The reason for that is, well, these philosophers, especially Sartre and Camus, they wrote in a way that more people can identify and can understand them. Their literary style appealed to a lot of people as compared to the more rigid, more academic style of writing of the other philosophers like, like uh, say, uh, Buber, well, the Buber, his I and thou is more poetic, but it's difficult to understand. Okay, as compared, for example, the the novels and the plays of Sartre and Camus, who actually won Nobel Prize for literature. Although, as you know, Sartre did not accept his award. Well, Marcel also wrote in literary forms, uh, some literary writings aside from his, you know, straight philosophical writings. Let me talk about phenomenology, although I will be discussing this in my subsequent lectures, but let's say that phenomenology is one more of a method, phenomenological method. Okay. It's a method developed by, first by Husserl, to understand reality, to understand things. So it's more of a method in epistemology. How do we know things? How do we know the essence of things? So if we want to know the essence of things, first we have to perform epohe, we have to bracket our prejudices. Okay. And then we have to focus on the eidos, the essence of things. There are many layers, many levels of the phenomenological method. So phenomenology, we have to go back to the things themselves. It's a method of going back to the things themselves. And how do we go back to the things themselves? bracket our prejudices because with our prejudices we cannot see the things in themselves and then of course we have to focus or rely on our first person standpoint by first person standpoint from our own personal experiences and one inspiration of this first first personal experience was what Descartes did in the Cartesian in his meditation he relied on his own thoughts, on his own personal experiences. Okay? So it's more of a method. But some of the existentialists, like for example, let's use for example Heidegger. He used the phenomenological method. But he used the phenomenological method in order to understand well, of course, he talks about being, but before he talks about being, he talks about the Dasein. And the Dasein is man. He wants to understand what man is. So let's focus on the personal experiences of man. The other, philo the other existentialists also focus on the personal experiences, but they use phenomenology not in order to understand what a particular object is, but in order to understand what man is. Their focus is anthropology or focus is existence. That is why we have a combination of phenomenological existentialism or existential phenomenology to distinguish it from the phenomenology of Husserl, which is mainly epistemological. 
But there are also other philosophers like Scheller, who used the phenomenological method of Husserl, not in epistemology, not in anthropology, partly in anthropology, but mainly in axiology, in understanding our values. So there is a, a deep connection between existentialism and phenomenology because of the method of existentialism or of phenomenology. Now, what is existentialism? For me, it's more of an attitude towards man. How do we understand man? What, what should be our main priority? What should be our main concern with man? Should we consider man as a substance? Or should we consider man in his own concreteness? Man as a loving being, man as a freedom-seeking being, man as a self-determining being. Those are the concerns of existentialism. And they used the method of phenomenology in order to articulate what their concept of what man is. Phenomenology can stand on its own. It can it has stood in its own with Husserl. And there are many other philosophers who were influenced by Husserl. Like for example, the, the, the Polish philosopher Roman and Garden were influenced by and even of course Edith Stein was influenced because he is she is the editor or assistant of, of Husserl. Okay? So it's a very complicated connection between existentialism and phenomenology. Uh, hopefully I can discuss more of that in the other lectures. Husserl was influenced by Brentano. In Brentano's training is in scholasticism. Uh, uh, Husserl has a deep connection with the scholastic method. The, the, uh, the metaphysics of Brentano is anchored on the scholastic, no, the scholastic philosophy. And one of the central pieces of scholastic philosophy, especially if you go back to Thomas Aquinas, is abstraction. And there is a very significant, there are significant similarities in connection between the phenomenological method of Husserl and the process of abstraction of St. Thomas Aquinas. Almost the same. Almost the same. When you do, for example, for example, the eidetic reduction, the eidetic reduction of Husserl is very much similar to the abstraction of St. Thomas. But what is the way, what is the connection between Thomas and Husserl? Brentano. 